Good evening, and welcome to the beautiful, historical Marionette Theater. Tonight, we're going to be discussing an early 90s drama romance. What happens when a grieving widow finds a mysterious stranger who comes to her rescue. And as they say, most gentlemen open the door for a lady. Well, maybe there's a few doors she can open for him. If you would, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Why, good evening, Mr. Smelly. It is a fine Friday in the uh, old uh, spring month of April. How are you tonight? I'm a soggy good. Soggy because, well, we've really gotten our fair share of rain. Um, Temperatures have been mild in the 60s or 50s, but lots of rain. Yeah, um, you know, I've got some of those smart speakers, and I'm so used to telling me that it's going to rain that day. So I've been more direct with it and say, when is it going to stop raining? And some of them actually will tell you that it'll say there will be a break for, you know, five minutes and blah, blah, blah. But, okay. Uh, I thought, you know, I, I thought you're going to tell me the answer from the machine is it'll stop in your dreams, buddy. Oh, yeah, right. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I have enjoyed uh, some of the um, – the benefits of the rain recently because I've been able to take my walks, you know, now that it's more spring like, and I don't know about your neck of the woods choppy, but there's this magical thing that's been occurring with the spring. Things are coming back to life. There are flowers that are blooming and some of the trees actually have blossoms. It's almost like a painting. Yeah. <clears throat> Around here. I think some of the crab apple trees um, or uh, apple trees are in, in flower. Even the um, magnolia tree, that's not the name of it. It's that those gi- that tree that has giant kind of purple pinkish blossoms. Is that magnolia? Uh, anyways, um, but it's all downtown where it tends to be warmer. Oh, lilac trees? No, not lilac. Uh, I think I got it right, magnolia tree. Okay. It's it's an early spring bloomer, but uh, unlike most blooming trees, the magnolia tree has g- gigantic blossoms, hmm. and um, they're open. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's looking like spring. You know, speaking of early bloomers. <laughs> Wow, Gertie, that outfit is something. I did not know <laughs> that they um had well can I talk about the bloomers? I mean, you were a cheerleader back in school, right? Yeah, 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 but I'm surprised you can see them. I'm sporting the same outfit that Jane Fonda wears in a scene in this movie. It's a floor length skirt yeah, with a pl- a flower print on it. Ain't it lovely? Mm. And a plain white collared top, as you can see. <laughs> uh, I think I wear it better than she does. Well, your hair certainly turned out better than hers. Um. Yeah. yeah, I haven't had a perm in a long time. <laughs> Are they still uh, giving those uh, those uh, free stylings out at the beauty college? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How'd you know, DJ? That's where I, that's where I go. Hmm. Well, um, Madame, if you could uh, do your little bunny hop down there to the stage, uh, f- folks are anxious to find out what we're talking about tonight. All right. Sure hope I don't trip on the skirt. <laughs> okay, see you down there. <laughs> there she goes. Have a nice trip. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Iris is a hard-working single parent who recently lost her spouse. Every day is a repeat of the last. Lather, rinse, repeat. Until one day, a charming stranger stands up to the hoodlum who stole her purse. In the days that follow, the two find themselves bumping into each other. 
Iris has noticed Stanley before, and she wonders what's been holding him back. A gentleman often opens a door for a lady, but maybe there's some she can open for him. Grab your bus pass and your reading glasses. It's time for Stanley and Iris with Jane Fonda and Robert De Niro. Take it away, fellas. What do you get when you take a dash of the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies? And a smidgen of screaming. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your hosts, DJ and Toppy. Rainy Toppy. So this is a movie from the 90s. I won't shame you. I won't talk about how long ago it was. But uh, I was just getting into my, well, my... um, what do they call that uh, when you, when you when you have your uh, debut you you Debutant, are um, oh uh, coming uh, out coming out there you go <laughs> although I had a different sort of those but that was later on <laughs> right <laughs> oh so Toppy um, in the nineties there was a few things going on because this is when the movie was made all right later. Uh oh! <laughs> now we, we just talked there? about John DeLorean, the last movie, and now Marion Barry, the mayor of DC, is getting caught with party favors. Yeah, and the funny thing is, he was the mayor of DC for a particularly long period. Unbelievable. Hmm. Morris Worm is released by Cornell graduate. Uh, while MIT, so that, uh, you know, a worm is like a computer virus. It was released. Oh, Jesus, I thought this was Mr. Worm, Mr. Morris Worm. Oh, okay. oh, it's oh. the uh, the title of the worm is The Morris Worm. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Like, it's the cat, you know, in the in the Nine Lives commercial. Gotcha, it, gotcha. It, this is a computer virus that was. Now, uh, it was, this, it was oh, this kind no. of an. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Was this kind of an early one? Um, well, considering that I don't remember even having AOL until around the mid nineties, you know, maybe ninety three, ninety four. So I can't imagine that it was for you know Windows ninety five that didn't come out yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyways, it must have been one of the first. Oh, thanks, Cornell. Uh huh. I mean, you know, you and your book learning. Um, yeah. Former Exxon captain Joseph Hazelwood is brought up on negligence charges regarding the Valdez oil spill. Negligence, I'll say. Yes, this is sleep on the job, or maybe a little more than that. Uh, the first McDonald's in Moscow opened in 1990. And then also a smoking ban took effect on all domestic U.S. flights of less than six hours. Oh, Jesus. Can you imagine the idea of people on those those tube of deaths uh, just smoking in a cabin where the air just circulates forever? It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's a little bit like um, being in an underground bus garage. You're never going to get rid of that exhaust. Right. Mm, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, anything less than six hours now, you can't light up. Oh, uh, so it, surely they've they've graduated that to never ever. Period. Who cares how long the flight is? Exactly. Also, you know, uh, there's also a distance limit 
on uh, how far you have to be from the building if you're smoking. So uh, Antonio Novella is sworn in as Surgeon General of the United States in 1990 <laughs> and became the first female and Hispanic American to serve in that position at the time. All right. Also in 1990, Driving Miss Daisy, a favorite of mine, wins Best Picture at the 62nd Academy Awards. Yay. Hey, DJ, mm-hmm. I got to go. I got to go make water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you're my best friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I saw that on stage. Oh, yeah? I saw, I saw the stage version. Absolutely charming and lovely. Every bit as good as the movie. Um yeah, if you can ever catch Mr. Driving Miss Daisy on stage, do it. I think we need to do a Jessica Tandy movie before the summer hits. Oh, my God. We've never done anything with her, in any, have we? Mm, no. Uh, so, also in 1990, uh, a terrible uh, period in history, Ryan White, a young man, died from acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS, at the age of 18. Now, for those of you who are not aware of the history, Ryan White was a young man who had a blood disorder, uh, hemophilia, which means that it's difficult for him to heal from wounds because the blood doesn't clot. And in the time that he became exposed to uh, the HIV and AIDS virus, we did not have blood screening for transfusions. So um, that's part of the history of the the AIDS pandemic was that Ryan White, who was a minor at the time, uh, became HIV positive and, you know, changed history because uh, anybody could get it. And that was part of the the learning. Anyways, in 1990, the Hubble telescope was launched into space before we figured out it wasn't perfect. Uh, President Herbert Walker Bush, Bush Sr., signed the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, against uh, discrimination of differently abled. And the Motion Picture Association of America, the MPAA, retired the X rating in favor of NC-17. Now, Toppy, do you know what NC-17 means? Not counting 17. No, I don't. (laughs) No children under the age of 17. Okay. That's hardly, well, okay, that's hardly what I think of as an X-rated movie today. I guess maybe I'm thinking of triple X-rated, which I guess is just adult movies. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, oh! by the way, we have, uh, we do this live, don't you know, and we have a chat room, and we have a guest um, tonight, and it's VJ, uh, it's V Money, and he's just been saying, uh, about smoking when when he rode the Amtrak, they used to, they used to time the stops so that if it was enough time for everyone to step off the train, have a cigarette, oh, and get right back on. Oh, yeah, I suppose so. Because mm-hmm, I know V Money uh, used to live in Boston for a time, and he's speaking of those fond memories. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, so that wraps up our history, <clears throat> except for Boyce. Yeah. So we're going to tell you who was born uh, in 1990. Uh, do the math from today. Did you, how, how many years ago was 1990? Uh, 34 years ago. Okay, if you say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that year we had Jonathan Lipnicki. <laughs> Jesus, is that, did I pronounce that right? You did. He was, um, I guess he was in Jeffrey McGuire with Tom Cruise. I don't Jerry. Know. Oh, he was Jerry? Okay. No, the, oh, the, Jerry. The, the movie was Jerry McGuire. Okay, all right. Uh, then Kathleen, I should have read this first, DJ. Hurlis? <laughs> Is that how you pronounce it? Um, Kathleen Hurlis? Yeah. Well, she was the original voice of Dora the Explorer. She was born uh, that year. And I know how to pronounce this. David Archuleta, uh, singer-finalist in the American Idol, don't you know? And now he's, what, the front singer for uh, Queen? 
Yes, and uh, not totally, you know, uh, a tabloid news, but in the in the realm of the church that we attend, the 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 men of the cloth, if you will, uh, he recently came out as either bisexual or pansexual. But that's not recent, is it? I mean, wasn't didn't he do that a long time ago? No, I think it was only in the last two or three years. Okay, all right. Uh, so, um, uh, this was a motion picture. It came out in the theaters. DJ, what was the competition for our movie tonight? All righty. So, back in 1990, now, uh, the film we're discussing tonight, Stanley and Iris, was released in February of 1990. So, it was, you know, it was almost a Valentine's movie. It's a, got a, a sweet little story. And uh, the films that were in the top of the box office, because, of course, we love the underdog here. Uh, the number one films that year were Ghost at $205 million. And that, of course, starred Mr. Patrick Swayze, who lost, unfortunately, long before his time. And up-and-coming Demi Moore. I, I recently listened to her autobiography. It was uh, Oh, yeah? Very interesting. She's uh, uh, she's showing up for uh, um for what's his face who's ailing. Uh, oh, Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's were, showing up for them for him. They were together for a number of years, and they had a house in Idaho of all places. They, I don't know if they had kids or not. Anyways, um, what was what else was up there? I hey. Okay. So, um, other films that made a mark in our history, at number two at the box office, brought in $170 million and introduced us, actually it wasn't her first film, but uh, gussied up, up and coming, Julia Roberts and paired her with Richard Gere. My, one of my mother's favorite movies, and actually, uh-huh. I, I like it too. Mm-hmm. Number three at the box office, it was a little film about a kid that got left behind when the family went on vacation. Macaulay Culkin and Catherine O'Hara brought in $143 million with Home Alone. And this was the first one, folks, back in 1990. Yeah, I would have, uh, I would have titled that uh, um, Slapstick... Uh, Euphoria or something like that because that movie was nothing but slapstick comedy, which mm-hmm. I I happen to love. Hey. Okay, are you telling me, do you see that our movie came in at number one hundred and twenty nine at the well? Con- considering that they there's probably uh, you know uh, two or three hundred movies that come out in a year. 129 is not bad. I mean, no, it's better than I could probably do with home movies. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Night of the Living Dead did one better. <laughs> yes. So, well, you know, to put things into perspective, Stanley and Iris brought in $5.8 million. Now, that was, that put it at 129 The film that did one better brought in $5.8 million. Well, $5.83 million, So, you know. That 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 um, that extra uh, twenty that you threw into the pot there, Night of the Living Dead, and uh, the the uh, film that was just below Stanley and Iris. It was a sequel. It was Texas Chainsaw Massacre three at five point seven million. Oh, oh my gosh! So, <clears throat> well, there you go. Um, <clears throat> Stanley and Iris. Uh, a small, quiet little movie. Well, how could it possibly compete against Ghost, Home Alone, and Women, Pretty Women? So let's talk about the director, Deej. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Martin Ritt, who was born in 1914. He passed away in 1990. By, well, Jeepers Creepers, that's the year this movie was made. Uh, so this, well, I think we could say... Stanley and Iris was Martin Ritt's last movie. Um, But he uh, is an American uh, director, producer, and actor. Active in film, theater, and television. Habba, habba, who is that, B-Money? That was the child actor. All up now. 
<laughs> really? Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sake. All right. Uh, anyways, uh, he was uh, mainly, uh, here's what Brett did uh, mm-hmm. with his material. He, he was an auteur of socially conscious dramas and literary adaptations. Um, but first, he was an actor uh, with the Federal Theater Project and Group Theater way back in the day. But he broke into the movies because he became an assistant to famous director Elia Kazan at the Actors Studio. And that was his break into directing. And he gave up acting and um uh, grabbed hold of this directing job and made a career out of it. He started doing uh, television, as one did back in the day, of live television in the 50s. Um, And uh, he did a lot of live television dramas. Uh, But he did make his first actual film for the theaters in 1957. It was called Edge of the City. Um, And a year later, his movie, The Long Hot Summer, based on the works of William Faulkner, was nominated for the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. The first of three times the director would be nominated for that honor. So early accolades for him. In uh, 1963, he did HUD. And that earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Director. And his 1965 John de la Carre adaptation, The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, won the BAFTA Award for Best British Film. So he's, I mean, right out of the gate, he's pretty uh, accomplished. Mm hmm. Well, uh, we get to uh, the 70s, and he's doing all kinds of great things. One of my absolute favorite movies of all time. This is the guy who directed Sounder in 1972. Um, mm, well, I'll never forget uh, that movie. Uh, and also Norma Ray in 1979. Both Sounder and Norma Ray were nominated for Best Picture Oscars. And um, uh, Ritt would go on to direct uh, the biggest stars of his times. And in his movies, 13 of them uh, won Academy Award wins or nominations. That includes Paul Newman, Melvin Douglas, Patricia Neal, Richard Burton, James Earl Jones, Jane Alexander, Paul Winfield, Cicely Tyson, Geraldine Page, Sally Field. Well, Sally Field won the Academy Award for Norma Ray. Oh, was that the uh, I li- You Like Me, You Really Like Me? Well, yeah, that's her famous, uh, her famous turn on stage at the Academy Awards where she was grasping the statue, kind of, well, not kind of, she was crying, and she said, you like me. You really like me. <laughs> <clears throat> and Sally Field, we do. I mean, come on. You're the fucking flying nun. Jesus. All right. And uh, now I'll she's s- helping you keep your bones strong. There you go. Uh, so th- <laughs> there you go. Um, four of his films, Edge of City, HUD, Sounder, Norway have been, and this is a huge honor, people, have been selected for the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Stanley and Iris was Ritz's final film, and it was a screenplay uh, by Harriet Frank Jr. and Irving Ravitch, and it was loosely based on the 1982 novel Union Street by Pat Barker. And that's our director tonight, Martin Ritt. We are at about the halfway mark in our show this evening. We're just stepping over this far. Gertie is just falling in love with the uh, refreshments she's serving tonight. They, some of them are pink and some of them have little flowers in them. And well, just <laughs> love is in the air. Mostly. Mm, so we're going to play 
a, a piece of an interview that Mr. Martin Ritt did for a, uh, well, they call him a trade magazine. It's an industry magazine that was made for the film industry called Film Comment. Oh, this should be good. How, how did growing up in the 30s affect your view ultimately towards making movies? Well, obviously, it affected a great deal. There was a, a great liberal surge in in the country, emotionally, uh, politically, and I was part of it. And all the gifted people and all the excitement that I knew around the theater were people in, in that sector of our intellectual thought. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough. I was working with an off-Broadway group called the Theater of Action, and I met Kazan then. I was lucky enough to get around the group theater, which are probably the single greatest group of American theater intellectuals that ever existed in together in a cohesive unit. And so that is obviously part of my heritage. And when I began to look for material, I began to look in that area, in that mold, naturally. And that's where I, I feel most comfortable, where I feel, uh, and now I feel most needed because the times being so different today. Uh, a liberal who's really working and trying to work in the mainstream is a very rare item. That is, if he, then probably a lot of liberals who are working in the mainstream but who don't make pictures about what, what they believe. They make other kinds of pictures. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's on my back. Delineate for me that kind of material. Well, just the two overtly political films that I've made, The Front and uh, The Morning of Wives, also Norm Array, also all the films I've made about blacks. Implicit in uh, all those films is a very strong and deep feeling for the, uh, for the minorities, for the disenfranchised. Certainly the blacks in this country have been disenfranchised for most of their lives. I'll never forget, you know, I never, didn't intend to cast Sicily in Sounder. And I, ca I, asked, I asked another actress to play, she turned me down. And uh, when Sis came to me, I said to her, Sis, you're a high fashion model. I mean, you're a great beauty. I need a, a working class peasant woman. And she said, Marty, there are no blacks in this country more than one generation removed from that experience. And that sold me right then, because I realized the truth of that. And I said, OK, that's it. You got the part. And I, yeah, I was very happy, because obviously she was terrific. That reminded me of, of what I was trying to say. And the fact that no amount of uh, seeming uh, sophistication or uh, movement into another class, uh, an upper middle class or an intellectual class, would remove the genuine problem that always existed, that every black really knew about it all the time. That scar tissue was there and deep. I've had occasion in my career to fight that because I haven't agreed with them all the time. But I'm very aware of it, very sympathetic toward it, and feel that it is one of the most grievous errors that we've made in, in my time in this country. So it should be noted that, that interview was done in 1986. And of course, as we talk about whether or not something is aged well, um, <laughs> I don't think that, uh, you know, that has to the point where we don't call people of color blacks anymore. It's it's more people of color or African-American. And, well, Mr. Merton Ritt in 1986 was trying to be as, uh, you know, diverse as he could. So there you go. Long time ago. Yes. So uh, before we actually discuss the members of the cast we're going to go ahead and play the trailer for this because this was a movie and it came out in february of 1990 here we go you live at home with your father you do your own cooking and, and you're not married is that the whole story 
I think that's about as much as I'm going to talk about. You're wearing your pink sweater. That's what you wear when you feel good. And when you feel bad, you wear the gray one. You're watching me. You stand out. This is your last day. Could you pick up your paycheck? What's the beef? Hey, listen, you can't read, you know? Well, you could, you could pick up the wrong box. You try to pick up a box of salt and uh, get a box of roach powder or something. Hey, you're dangerous. For Stanley Cox, life was a closed door. You ask yourself, have I got a name if I can't write it? Am I a human being if I can't read it? You can turn to stone. Why don't you do something about it? But Iris was the key. I wanted to ask you if, uh, if you could do something. She have started this. I'll be around. That opened up his world. Teach me to read. This is... A river. This is... A... Woman. What they taught each other about life. Finish this sentence. I'm good at it. I'm good at getting the right teacher. You won't find in any book. What goes on between me and you is more than sex and maybe even more than love. I don't know what to call it, but we patched each other up and we put each other together again, and that's glue, lady. Brady, so we all know it takes a boatload of talent to put together something like a movie. This was on the silver screen, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and tell you about the fine people that made the, the characters up in this film. So I'm going to start off with our leading lady, Miss Jane Fonda, and I dare say that she not only st- inspired the beginning of this series matinee minutia and my fondness of films that my father introduced me to but this is our third film with mr jane fonda in it now jane is the daughter of legendary hollywood actor henry fonda and brother of actor peter fonda who was famous for independent film breakthrough of easy rider in 69 Jane is recognized as a film icon. Fonda's work spans several genres, over six decades of film and television. And she's the recipient of numerous accolades, including two Academy Awards, two British Academy Film Awards, I think that's the BAFTAs, and seven Golden Globe Awards, also a Primetime Emmy and the AFI Lifetime a Life Achievement Award, the honorary baby, 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 the honorary Palme d'Or, um, sounds French, and the, <laughs> it is, it is, <laughs> sounds uh, the Cecil B. DeMille Award. Stanley and Iris was Jane Fonda's thirty sixth film, not five, not ten, not a couple dozen, thirty six films. Now, in the five years leading up to Stanley and Iris, Jane Fonda would appear in four films over those five years, including the iconic Agnes of God with oh. Anne Bancroft and up-and-coming Meg. All right, so she, you haven't lived until you've seen Jane Fonda and Anne Bancroft playing off each other in the same movie. They are phenomenal and I would recommend Agnes of God just to see Jane Fonda and Anne Bancroft together. I mean, uh, in essence, this itself demonstrates her um, diversity of her career. I mean, she goes from Barbarella, where she's, uh, you know, a scantily clad space woman. And in Agnes of God, she's a nun. Um, <laughs> in 85. Uh, well, no, 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 uh, no, no, uh, Meg Tilly, Meg Tilly is a Meg nun. Meg Tilly is the nun. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, Jane Fonda plays a, a, kind of a reporter, actually. Okay. So in 86, Jane Fonda was in a film called The Morning After with Jeff Bridges and up and coming Raul Julia, who would later be Gomez in the, uh, 90s Adams Family's movies. And in 89, Jane was in a movie called Old Gringo with classic film actor Gregory Peck and up and coming 
Hispanic actor Jimmy Smits. Who have yet to see that. <laughs> now, uh, fun fact, this is not Star Trek, but this is sci-fi. Do you know who Jimmy Smits would later go on to be in the more recent prequel movies? Uh, well, so you mean like... No, okay, no. You just gotta <laughs> say it because I don't know. Jimmy Smith was in a very, very influential sci-fi franchise, and he was Princess Leia's stepdad. Oh, gee, I forgot. Yep, yep. Yeah. But he was also my favorite president uh, elected in um, uh, Martin Sheen's The West Wing. Anyways, Fonda made her acting debut with this uh, 1960 Broadway play, There Was a Little Girl, for which she received a nomination for the Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Play. And she made her screen debut later that same year with the romantic comedy Tall Story. She rose to prominence, <laughs> tall joke there, during the 60s for the comedy's period of adjustment in 62. Sunday in New York in 63, Cat Baloo in 65, and a favorite of mine, Barefoot in the Park in 67, which I believe she did with Robert Redford, if I'm not yep, mistaken. that's right, yep. And of course, the iconic Barbarella that was the beginning of our entire season, or series, six seasons ago, before receiving her first Oscar nomination for They Shoot Horses, Don't They, in yeah. 69. Yeah, that's a good movie to see when you're really depressed because they shoot horses, don't they? Will put you over the edge and you will kill yourself. I'm sorry, Jesus Christ! <laughs> Get your uh, prescriptions refilled, Jesus. Folks. Oh, so Bond then established herself as one of the most acclaimed actresses of her generation, winning the Academy Award for Best Actress twice in the '70s for Clute in '71, which. We may be talking about in a future episode and coming home in 78. Her other nominations are for Julia in 77, the China syndrome, which we've talked about in a past episode here that was made in 79 on golden pond in 81. If, uh, of the last film of her father, wasn't it? Yeah. Notable because they were finally in the same movie. And, um, yeah, that was a very sweet 1981. And The Morning After in 86, which I've mentioned, um, consecutive hits included Fun with Dick and Jane in 77 and California Suite in 78, as well as The Electric Horseman in 79 and a personal favorite in 1980, 925. And you cannot get better casting then Dolly Parton and Lily Tomlin with Jane Fund. It was so good that in more recent years they were reunited, and we'll talk about that. In <laughs> I, I, had, I didn't see it. I hope it was good, but who knows? Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about 9 to 5. I'm talking about Jane Fund and Lily Tomlin now. Oh, okay, of course. But they were in 9 to 5 together. Yes. So um, let's see here. Now, um, Nine to five sustained fund as box office drawing power, and she won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Actress in a limited series or movie for the television film The Doll Maker in eighty four. Toppy, was that the one that she was in with Betty Davis? I honestly don't know, Deej. It, I'll it, have to I, look I'm not, I'm not familiar with that at all. Oh, there there was a terrible um HBO movie with Jimmy Stewart in it, where he was um, married to Betty Davis. And I think Jane Fonda is in it, but I digress. So it would be 15 years after Stanley and Iris in 1990 before Jane Fonda would return to film. Now, it should be noted that after these decades of being in film already, she had gotten to a place in her life where she had married a man with deep pockets. She was married to Mr. Ted Turner, the man who owned TBS. And I want to say the Atlanta Braves baseball team. It, so, yeah, it definitely was a baseball team. I don't know which one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So after this period in her life, she said no more for now. 
stepped out of the limelight and continued to do her her work with charities. But it would be 15 years after Stanley and Iris before Jane Fonda would return to the silver screen. And that was in a delightful film in 2005 with Jennifer Lopez and Wanda Sykes called Monster in Law. And <laughs> Poppy, I know you probably haven't seen it, but my favorite moment in that movie is where Wanda Sykes has a scene and she's the personal assistant of Jane Fonda's character in this movie. Um, basically, uh, Jane Fonda is an overbearing mother who doesn't trust the woman that her son's going to marry. And uh. so um, Wanda Sykes' character is uh, sort of hanging out with Jennifer Lopez's character, the bride-to-be. And she's worried that Jane Fonda's character is going to break her spirit because she's just a brassy lady. And after uh, some interactions where she could hold her own, Wanda Sykes says to her, I was wrong about you. You don't need a gun. <laughs> <laughs> so in more recent years, Jane Fonda has appeared in seven, seven seasons of Netflix's. And this is where the reunion comes in. Ah. Netflix's Grace and Frankie, which she starred in alongside Lily Tomlin, as well as personal favorite Mr. Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston. Now, since then, Jane Fonda has appeared in four films, including 80 for Brady in 2023 with Diane Keaton and two films in a series called Book Club with Candace Bergen and Mary Steenburgen, as well as the 2023 sequel, Book Club to the next chapter. And to date, Jane Fonda has 65 acting credits, Toppy. Yep, wow. pretty amazing. A long career um, and through so many distinct periods of filmmaking. Uh, for example, Clute is incredibly different from tonight's movie. We must not forget, DJ, that she also had an empire of video exercising that I think, I don't know if she was the first, but but she certainly must have made five kabillion dollars by her exercise videos. And she made, uh, what do you call those things that you wear around your legs? <laughs> Leg warmers? Yes. Okay, well... Uh, she created a whole industry for leg warmers. Yes. All right. And Let's cashed look. in on that empire due to the innovation of a device that now lets you watch things over and over again in your home, Toppy, the VCR. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was the era that uh, she sold her stuff was on VCR. Oh, God, that was a long time ago. Uh, let's move on to Robert De Niro. Well, mm. who doesn't know the guy that said, You talking to me? You talking to me? Mm. Are you talking to me? In the, uh, in the iconic movie Taxi, directed by... Uh, <laughs> I was going so well, DJ. Was it Martin Scorsese? Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's terrible to get old people. Anyways... <laughs> Uh, Robert De Niro was born in New York City, um, and <clears throat> uh, I didn't know this, but at the age of two, uh, De Niro's father came out as gay, and the couple divorced. That's interesting. Uh, his father remained close to De Niro th uh, during his childhood. De Niro would begin acting classes at the Dramatic Workshop, workshop and made his stage debut in school at the age of 10. Mwah! Oh, he played the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz. I mean, who hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, and I guess it's said that De Niro found performing as a way to relieve his shyness and became fascinated by cinema, so... 
Oh, De Niro, say it ain't true. Well, he dropped out of high school at the age of 16 to pursue acting. That's probably the kind of guy he was. De Niro later said, when I was around 18, I was looking at TV show, at a TV show, and I said, if these actors are making a living at it, and they're not really all that good at it, well, I can't do any worse. He was probably watching Gilligan's Island. Anyways, I can't do any worse than them. Uh, he went on to study acting at the HB studio and Lee Strasberg's actor studio, which was a highly acclaimed place to study. De Niro also studied with Stella Adler of the Stella Adler Conservatory, another very prominent place to train, where he was exposed to the techniques of the Stanislavski no St- <laughs> Stanislavski system. We're not going to explain that to you. Google it. Right. Uh, as a young actor, De Niro was inspired by the work of Marlon Brando, Montgomery Cliff, James Dean, Greta Garbo, Geraldine Page, because he just found it fascinating the way Geraldine Page would put the whole, her whole hand into her mouth <laughs> at any given time. I'm sorry. I mean, she was popular at parties. No, that's a running joke with me and Geraldine Page. I'm sorry. De Niro began acting in film during the mid-60s. His first credited role was working for Brian De Palma, then the future director of such films as Phantom of the Paradise, Carrie, and Scarface. Uh, he, he Actually, De Niro got right in with a whole bunch of directors who were just beginning their career at the time. Uh, so let's just say he was in the right place at the right time. Um, Stanley and Arts was De Niro's 31st film. His film before was We- We're No Angels with Sean Penn. His film after was Goodfellas, and who doesn't know Goodfellas? <laughs> that was done in 1990 with Ray Liotta and Joe Pes- Pesci, and that was a Martin Scorsese film. In five years prior to he would appear in seven films, including Brazil, Angel Heart, boy, I totally forgot he was in that, and Jackknife, uh... So, and that was in 89. In the five years after Stanley and Iris De Niro would appear in 14, Jesus, 14 films. Uh, Amongst those are Awakenings with Robert and Williams, Backdraft with Kurt Russell, Cape, oh, that's one of my favorites, the remake of Cape Fear. Mm. Uh, also directed by Martin Scorsese Nick Nolte and Jessica Lange had the lead and Robert De Niro played the v- oh god the creepiest villain ever ah! mm-hmm. oh, god, that, that was so good alright more recently De Niro was cast in the role of Ben Stiller's character's father-in-law in Meet the Parents 2010 the s- trilogy uh, of Meet the Fockers and Little Fockers, uh, which were really cute, uh, and eventually would include co-stars Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand. De Niro continues to act in film and had three movies in 2023 alone. Jesus! <laughs> and today, he has 135 acting credits. There you go. That's Robert De Niro, kids. I'm not great at math, but I think that's twice as many movies as Jane Fonda. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but here we got a special um, part uh, mm-hmm. in this movie that was really kind of key. But in the background, <laughs> she's got a crazy name. Who are we talking about? DJ? Oh, well, I'm going to take uh, artistic license here and uh, I'll fix it in post. But I'm going to rewind a second. <laughs> so, Toppy, one of the movies that we mentioned in De Niro's career was a oh. little gem in 87. What was that movie in 87 that he did? You mentioned uh, it a bit ago. Did? Okay. Uh, maybe you better just tell me. He did so many, DJ. Angel Heart? Okay, Angel Heart, tell me about know, it. I never do you know it. what was special about Angel Heart that um, basically ended someone's television career? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I remember the hoopla, and it was Lisa Bonet, mm-hmm. and she she was in uh, this TV sitcom. 
Uh, um, uh, the man about the pudding pops. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying to forget his. I'm just for. Who the fuck was it? Uh, uh, Mister Rufy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess she was partly nude, and that just didn't sit well. Um, she, was, she played the oldest dog. Well, the oldest child at home on the Cosby show. And that just didn't fly because, you know, she was supposed to be part of wholesome family programming. Yeah. I never really understood it because before you knew it, she sprung off into her, her own show, which was the same character, but she was the lead and she was, I never, you know, I mean, but she didn't last past one season. They dropped her. Oh, in that show. Yeah, she, oh. she was part of a spinoff, but then um, they, uh, you know, as they say in Hollywood, they blacklisted her. I guess so. Uh, uh, it's kind of ironic that Cosby was kind of behind all that, <laughs> given what we oh, know. Oh, definitely. Just, uh, but she, I wasn't she. Oh, uh, she was involved with um, Lenny Kravitz for a long time. There, they they actually were either married or something. But she was married to um, Hottie Jason Momoa for a while okay. too. Let me let me just make sure I know who Lenny Kravitz is. He's like a singer, right? Yes, and he's okay. Never mind. Very, <laughs> and uh, a lot of, of people. Cons- people a, I've, I've ever a seen. lot of people consider him to be sort of a Bob Marley reincarnate, but more metal. Okay, I just know that he looks crazy in photos. <laughs> All right, where are we? Oh, we want to talk. Start we DJ. We got to talk about Swozy. Yeah, so we have a. Uh, Another member that uh, just showed up in the audience there, Matt from Chubbs Gone Wild, has joined us. And, of course, as we are one to do, um, we have a round of applause for a regular showing. Woo! All right. So, um, talk about getting excited. We have a lady named Swoozy Kurtz in this film. She played Sharon, who is Jane Fonda's character's sister. Now, Susie was born in Nebraska. Her father was a World War II Air Force bomber pilot, and he named her after a type of plane he had flown called the Swoozy, which was uh, because it was sort of a half swan, half goose. Are you, is that <laughs> She was named after the a, a plane? Oh, I my mean, God. There, there are uh, sports cars that are named after women. Okay. So, Kurtz first began acting on television in the late 60s. She started her career off with a guest appearance on the Donna Reed Show at the age of 17. Um, I can guarantee you back then that she wasn't the girl who, um, you know, stubbed her toe and then went into hiding. Um but by the 70s, she was appearing in the daytime drama As the World Turns. So, top- <laughs> Or, or uh, uh, alternate title is As the Stomach Turns. <laughs> yeah. But, Toppy, there was a time that, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, not so quietly kept secret that you were a fan of the daytime dramas. It was As the World Turns your brand of poison? Get out of here. <laughs> No, no, no. You know well, me. I okay. was it might have been into, Gertie's mom's. Yeah, I was so, turned into a different kind of Okay. Super. So in seventy eight in seventy eight, oh you were watching the uh the telenovelas there from uh you know yeah. the you South go. Americas, yeah. So in seventy eight, Kurtz was part of the ensemble cast of Mary Tyler Moore's short lived variety series called Mary. That was my best guess. <sighs> Uh, that also included David Letterman and Michael Keaton. Um, <laughs> By the way, you, you guys haven't lived to see David Letterman pre-talk show as a kind of a, well, just an actor, 
on that variety series, Mary. Just holy Jesus. It's no wonder David Letterman said, you know what, I'm I'm never going to act in anything ever again. Did he have better teeth then? No, um, I don't think so. Not yet. <laughs> so in 81, Kurtz began two seasons alongside Tony Randall in the sitcom Love, Sydney, in a role that earned her the first of her 10 Emmy Award nominations. Now, yes. Now, in 1990, by the time Stanley and Iris came into being, she won her first Emmy for guest starring role on Carol Burnett's comedy series, Carol and Company. Yeah, a lot of people forget that Carol Burnett did kind of a short-lived return to sketch shows. Um, now, I don't know how, the best way to describe it, but they did sketches, um, mm-hmm. kind of like she did on her first show, but... It was a whole new cast with Carol Burnett. It was called Carol and Company. Didn't last too long. And, you know, with significantly less music than the original show. Oh, Uh, yeah. There were no (laughs) Flaming Queens dancing. No. Do do you know that that's one of the main reasons why the collection of the Carol Burnett original show is not available is because of music rights? You know, that sounds right. I, I never put that together, but sure, that's that's exactly why, yeah. So Stanley and Iris was Swoozie Kurtz's 12th film. Not her first or second, she's been to the rodeo. And her film before Stanley and Iris was Dangerous Liaisons in 88 with Glenn Close, John Malkovich, and Michelle Pfeiffer. Now, um, I'm a little late to the party, and so I actually want to see this now. Oh, yeah. Uh, So her film after Stanley and Iris was a film in 1990 with Michael Caine and uh, the future star of Downton Abbey, Elizabeth McGovern, in A Shock to the System. In the five years before Stanley and Iris, Kurtz would appear in five films, including with Goldie Hawn in 86, Wildcats, where Goldie was the um, the lady football coach. And in 88, she was in Vice Versa, which, uh, you know, was a thing. Then they, they did these movies where uh, parents swap bodies with their kids. Oh, no, not one of those. Okay. But Judge Reinhold and Fred Savage in 88. And then in that in the 88 also, she was in Bright Lights Big City with Michael J. Fox. So after Stanley and Iris, Susie Kurtz would work primarily in television, would but, but would appear in Reality Bites. It's a Winona Ryder film in 94. More recently, Kurtz continues to work in television and was part of the cast of the former Friends star, Matt LeBlanc, on CBS with Man with a Plan, which was about a stay-at-home dad. And most recently, she was in the Mayim Bialik, yes, the one that was Blossom and a host on Jeopardy for a while, and she was also the the nerdy girlfriend on Big Bang Theory, Um so Susie Kurtz played the mom on my Ambialic show, Call Me Cat, which actually was an American remake of a British TV show. And to date, Susie Kurtz has 98 acting credits. Uh, I was telling DJ before we started that <clears throat> uh, for the life of me, I thought I was watching Juliet Lewis in this role. I don't know. If anyone else sees that similarity, but Swoozie Kurtz and 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 Juliet Lewis could be sisters. They're so similar. I, I, I everything, all their mannerisms to me, they're very similar. Um. Uh. Well, listen, DJ. Uh, was this uh, uh, your first time uh, with uh, this movie, or had you seen it before? I hadn't seen this before. In fact, I'm a little surprised that I hadn't because Jane Fonda was one of my father's favorite actresses. In fact, I've uh, recently it's come to my attention that there are just certain ironies in life. And not only was she one of his favorites, but they also were born in the same year. With your father? 
Yes, my dad was born in September of 37, and Jane was born in December. Oh, all right. And and there's some there's some reason that your father wasn't in Barbarella. No, I don't. You don't have to answer that. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I I you know I guess back in the day I was too busy watching Ghost and all those other movies. I never saw it either until tonight. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I really didn't know what to expect. I'd seen. Uh, the director's pre- uh, previous movie, uh, Murphy's Romance, um, Martin Ritt directing Murphy's Romance and tonight's movie. And I remember really liking uh, Murphy's Romance. And, and I, I did see Norma Ray, another Martin Ritt movie. And I think one thing he really does great is showing us plain, ordinary people. And he went through a lot of uh, uh, efforts to just show these characters as plain, ordinary people, not heroic in any way, just plain people with all their faults and uh, and uh, goodness, just sort of showing. And... In that way, I I think this movie is a triumph because it does show two normal people going through something together, um, uh, stumbling their way through it and getting somewhere, but in a very just plain, simple, ordinary way. And in that way, it's a very satisfying movie. I I feel like this is such a charming movie because... It has a heartfelt story. I, you know, a lot of people can relate to the concepts that are in this. I mean, you find yourself in a place in life where you maybe don't have something to look forward to. And so you certainly would relate to characters like Jane Fonda's Iris in this movie, who has a factory job. You know, she lost her husband. And she has to support her family at home. Maybe she doesn't have a college education. And in her little town, this is how she can make ends meet, is by getting on the bus every day and going to work in this factory. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, this is where the only people she knows are, because she doesn't have time for a social life. And eventually... It, uh, you know, it almost becomes a tradition, unfortunately, because her daughter ends up working in the factory. In fact, there's a scene in the film, Toppy, and, you know, I'm almost calling you out onto the carpet here. But, you know, there's a scene in the movie where everyone is looking in uh, essentially at the camera, but uh, looking away from their task, their job at the bakery, the factory. And you could see that somebody has arrived on the scene and for just a moment, they took uh, a little bit longer than they, they might've to reveal who was coming into the room. What was your initial impression of that before you saw who was coming in the room? Did you have any thoughts that were different than the reveal? Well, I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure we saw the same movie. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I remember that scene, but but didn't Robert De Niro come through the door? He did not. That's who I was expecting. Okay. In fact, this was at a point in the movie after where she started teaching him to read, because there's a moment in the film in the just before the the halfway mark, I guess, where um, Stanley has lost his father. You know, he has lost one of his jobs. And how did that happen, Toppy? How did he lose the first job that we were aware of watching the film? Well, he <clears throat> it was a, as it was a factor of the fact that he couldn't read and he couldn't write. And they were afraid he might make a mistake that would, you know, he might put he was he was a cook and he might put the wrong ingredient like you know rat poison in the pancake batter or something yeah and jane fonda's character came to his defense because she thought he was going to lose his job right then and there 
the boss came in and, you know, said, I'm missing all these things. And, you know, who's, you know, getting fat on my dime? And she said, well, it's not him. He can't read or write. So he didn't steal your stuff. So, but, um, anyways, yeah, I, I thought that it was going to be Robert De Niro's character, Stanley, because he had learned to read and he was starting to improve his life. And I thought maybe he would have come up through the ranks and maybe had become a supervisor or something at the factory. But who, do you remember who walked into the No, I, no, I, I honestly, no, just, yeah. It no, ended up no. being Iris's daughter. Oh, just had a baby and so jane fonda's character has this moment where she is so upset with her daughter because her daughter is supposed to be going to school and getting a future to provide for the new child and right. she says to her daughter don't you know this line doesn't go anywhere which yeah, yeah. has several meanings it means that she's stuck at that job this is how she's providing for her family. And now that her daughter has dropped out of school, she has no future. Yeah, I, I, I recall now. And, and, you know, that in families where there are jobs like this, these factory jobs, you know, very often generations of, of people, uh, a whole family uh, generation will go to work at the same place. Uh, DJ, I, I want to direct our attention to the chat room and the ever mysterious Cronhaven create Cronhaven mm-hmm. has dropped in and she dropped a question that I think is interesting. She asked, do you folks feel that being in comedies changes audiences willingness to accept actors in subsequent dramatic roles? And I think she's, probably thinking of Robert De Niro who was who has been in some comedies uh and uh and and so that's worth thinking about I'm interested DJ if you have an answer but I want to mm-hmm. read um in the chat room Matt's answer to Crone who says I think it depends on the level of the comedy like Jim Ker- Carey had a hard time being taken as a dramatic actor. But Lily Tomlin, for example, seemed to have no problem with it. That's true. Um, I mean, I think it can. I think dra- dramatic actors doing a comedy are taking a risk. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um but I've never felt, I don't think I've personally felt like um, if I see an actor in a comedy and then, okay, you know what? <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you. Mm-hmm. There were a couple of movies that Robin Williams was in where he was deeply dramatic and played a really weird villain. I think in two movies, I think. One hour photo. Is absolutely one. And I think there may have been another. Anyways. Mm, I never was able to get over the fact that that was Robin Williams. Uh, the guy that we saw in Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, at least that was my personal experience. I remember enjoying the movie, but but I never really got away from the fact that that's Robin Williams <laughs> and he's being mean. <laughs> uh, I think there are other times where I've seen it work much better. Uh, but what do you think, DJ? You know, um, I'm the odd duck because, of course, we're doing a show about movies that weren't hits. Some of the time, Um, but um, I actually find it interesting because uh, if I find out that a comedic actor is trying to do a dramatic role, that gets me interested because I want to know if they can pull it off. Now, uh, I have an unpopular opinion because, uh, you know, as Matt said in the chat room, he used an example of Jim Carrey. 
I actually am more of a fan of Jim Carrey in dramatic roles, which there haven't been many of than his comedy roles. I don't think he's a, you know, he's a bad actor. I just think that some of his comedy, it, um, it tries too hard. It's not something that you just feel inclined to laugh at. It's just awkward. So it's like a goofy kid. That's fine. When you're younger, it's more believable. But when you get to be an adult, it's a little hard to believe the goofy comedy versus with the dramatic, you know, you don't expect it. So I, I find it a pleasant surprise when an actor can actually do both. But to Crone's point, I do have expectations to think, well, this is a comedic actor. How are they going to pull this role off? Which, you know, it uh, kind of turns it on its side for me because I want to find out. It's like the end of the book. It's like, don't tell me the ending. I want to find out. Did they do that justice? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Matt brought up Jim Carrey as an example who did do some dramatic roles. Um, and I think it's almost like Jim Carrey today is like, you know, refusing to do anything like he ever used to do because somehow he's a little out there. I don't know. Something's changed within him where that, that doesn't interest him um, today, but yeah, I, I think it just depends on the actor and the and the uh, and the project. Um, and again, I just sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. We probably should wrap it up, DJ. It's ten yeah. nineteen. So we were we were talking about how we found this movie, and um, I just wanted to to take a brief moment to reflect because. As I've mentioned before, um, uh, much of the spirit of this show is discussing things that were introduced to me by my dearly departed dad. And I found that Stanley and Iris was a good reflection of some of my father's life because uh, he grew up during the 50s and his family divorced then. And as a result of the divorce, his siblings were all put into different foster homes. Now, uh, my father also survived scarlet fever when he was just a child. So he was left with a learning disability as part of that. And at the time that his family divorced, he was only in middle school. So uh, my dad actually had to drop out of school to support himself and his family. And by the time that he met my mother and they married, he only had a seventh grade education. So I remember as a kid, um, certainly by the time I was in junior high, I would have to read certain things for my dad, like the the TV guide. Now, um, fortunately, during that period of me growing up, there became uh, adult education programs that eventually came about and he was able to get tutoring. Um, our family's doctor's wife was a retired teacher and she tutored him and he was able to increase his reading level. But, uh, at one point, um, the program got discontinued due to funding. So Stanley and Iris has a special place in my heart because as a child growing up, I got told stories about my father having held, quote-unquote, several odd jobs before he and mom met, when the truth of the matter was, just like Stanley Cox in Stanley and Iris, he probably lost several jobs when they found out he couldn't read very well. Um, DJ, that's interesting. Uh, I know we got to go, and we're going a little long, but hang with us, audience. Uh, So in Stanley and Iris... It takes Robert De Niro's character a superhuman effort to ask for help. There's this great scene in the pouring rain where she's trying to talk 
to Jane Fonda's character who just wants to get on the bus and get a ride home after her job, and he can't come out with it. He just he tries to ask for help, and he just can't. And she says, well, I'm, I'm going to get on my bus. You can contact me later if you want. And she goes up under the bus, and he runs after her and yells her name, and she turns around uh, at the entrance on the bus, and he says, teach me to read. He finally comes out with it. Mm. How was your father in asking for help? Was it difficult? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not entirely sure because I'm the last of the four kids in my family. So it wasn't as difficult by the time I came around. But I, I also am, uh, you know, I'm heartened by this story because it makes me imagine what it would be like to talk to your children about, you know, the past. Like in my case, I was saying about the odd jobs that he held. And I can't imagine what it would be like to skirt around the subject and uh, basically disguise the fact that you were ashamed to, to your own children that you you didn't have the same level of education as they did maybe right so um but yes it, it, it definitely took courage for him to trust her to the point where he asked her to help him and it came at a pivotal time because he had just lost his father in a nursing home and uh, it was partly because he couldn't keep up a job because he couldn't read yeah well dj we should wrap up Okay. Um, um, in case you didn't know, we're both recommending uh, a watch of Stanley and Iris as just a nice, personable movie about real people. It is available for free on several services. And- oh, I watched it on Tubi. Yes, Tubi, Roku, and um, I believe Hulu and... Uh, Oh, just just use my favorite search service, justwatch.com, and it'll find all the services it's available on. Yeah. So uh, here we are near the lobby, and we're going to tell you things you might enjoy if you like things like Stanley and Iris. This is our snack tray. I'll go first. Yeah. I've got film, sweet little film from 84. So it Whoa, was, it's even earlier. I know, and I won't tell you how old I was then. But this stars our leading man, Mr. Robert De Niro, with a different leading lady, with Meryl Streep. I'm going to recommend 84's Falling in Love. And this is about, although they live married lives, two strangers keep running into each other, starting a friendship that could blossom into so much more. Mm, Falling in Love. Sounds like maybe a little bit more of a rom-com than our movie. I couldn't describe Stanley and Iris as a rom-com at all. Could you? No. No. Well, what about Falling in Love? Is that more of a rom-com? Probably. Okay. Uh, It just sounds like I haven't seen it. Um, But uh, I wouldn't mind seeing Robert De Niro uh, acting around Meryl Streep. Yeah. All right, I'm going to recommend uh, another movie directed by the director of our movie tonight, Martin Ritt. And it is Murphy's Romance from 1985. We are going backwards. (laughs) (laughs) So Murphy's Romance is an American rom-com film. Uh, Emma, Sally Field, moves to a ranch with her son after a divorce and befriends the older Murphy, James Garner, in an excellent role. But things turn complicated when her ex shows up. Uh, it's just a nice romance comedy with a lot of heart. And Martin Ritt brings to it the same kind of feeling he brings to tonight's movie, where you just feel you just feel like you're watching ordinary people. Hmm. And what was the name of that movie again? Uh, Murphy's Romance from 1985. All righty. So uh, Gertie is out here just anxious to get her ride because uh, she, she got the alert that the uh, the Uber's on its way. So, Toppy, <laughs> we, we do this thing uh, where we tell people what's coming up next. Grab that bag of coins for me. 
All right, here you go. Damn, eight dead coin. Yeah. And we got this little machine. Yeah. It's coin in or health. Somebody. No. Okay, grab Damn. the capsule for me. Oh, it's uh, called a capsule, Deej. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you open it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, next time on that name and issue. From the director of Roots, the story of an American family of trees. No, 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 no. Uh, director of Roots. In the 1930s, a carpenter in a small California town struggles to bring up four young boys after the death of his wife. His worst fears come true when the government accuses him of neglect and places his children into foster homes and institution. Mark Harmon, may I say, a young Mark Harmon, <laughs> a star is in this TV movie about survival as a single parent during the Great Depression. Next time on Matt Name Minutia, uh, we're going to sh- uh, talk about a movie called After the Promise. Okay, and uh, when do you say that's going to be about? So All right. Oh, the well. First and third Friday of each month. Well, then that must be the third, because mm-hmm. that's the first Friday in uh, uh, May. Yes, <laughs> that's the next month. Because after April showers comes what? May flowers. Yes. So, so uh, May 3rd, uh, that's a Friday, and we'll be doing it live at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, here's a super secret, folks, not quietly kept, because uh, this was a TV movie, and uh, it was never released onto DVD, so some kind person out there uh, might have made it available for people to see it. So, Oops. All right. Well, say no more. Say yeah. no more. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, this this happens on uh, Matt's Chubb's Gone Wild uh, a show every once in a while. They, uh, I don't know. It's just not totally revealed how they got their hands on what they were watching. <laughs> right. Oh, so, uh, Toppy, also, um, I you forgot to mention something that I asked you to remind me about. So I'll just say it quick and I'll... I'll just uh, pour it right in here. So uh, one of the cute things about my parents' relationship, and they're no longer with us. We lost them before their time, unfortunately. Um, We have my parents' love letters. Now, it's not nothing, um, you know, titillating. It's not like, um, you know, opening a hustler or anything. Because my parents met during the 50s. They, right. they were very rural, conservative people. And since my father had a hard time reading and writing, it was very cute because his future mother-in-law probably helped him write some of his love letters to uh, his bride-to-be. Aww. So uh, here's grandma helping her future son-in-law write letters to her daughter and of uh, course i'm sure you know that those were very tight-lipped and very proper <laughs> oh yeah i mean we're you know <laughs> chastity all the way i mean um, back in, back in the days of um you know laverne and shirley where it was supposed to be like the 50s yeah. whenever whenever they would talk about doing the deed yeah. laverne and shirley would say they would call it Vodio do. Yeah, Vodio do do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I Vodio, but I don't Vodio do. Vodio do do. <laughs> Anyways, that's funny. Uh, milk oh. and Coke. Ugh. All right. Yes. So we, are, we are leaving you, folks. Oh, Gertie's Before, sipping her milk and Pepsi with yeah. something extra. And, All right. uh, uh, we we want to say hi to the folks in the chat room. Uh, Thanks uh, so much for joining us. Uh, Matt from Chubb's Gone Wild podcast. Uh, we had V Money in there for a while, and we had uh, the ever the ever elusive and mysterious Crown Haven, who's still in there, and she she's typing something right now. Anyways, thank you all for coming to uh, be with us while we do this live. We really really appreciate it. Okay. So, uh, Toppy, if you would uh, do us a favor and say goodnight in the uh, 
the ways of that kindly older couple that were on the, the radio. Uh, say goodnight. Oh, wait a minute. Good night, Grace. I messed it up. Good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to matineeminutia.com. Click the YouTube icon for live video. Enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. 